We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. It's great to see everybody. Welcome to The Point, and a special welcome to all of you who are with us for the first time today. Thank you for spending the morning with us. And a special welcome to everybody joining us live online this morning. We're glad that you're with us as well. Judges chapter six, we're gonna begin there this morning. If you have your Bible, turn there. If you have it on your tablet, your phone, you can turn that on there. And if you don't have any of those, the words are on the screen. Uh, Judges chapter six, beginning with verse number one. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in the mountain clefts and caves and strongholds. And whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other Eastern peoples invaded the country. And they camped on the land and ruined all the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. And they came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Now, every week as I stand up here to share the word of God with you, um, each message goes through a very extensive process that usually begins, if not months, at least many weeks out uh, from the day of delivery. And so what happens is, is I spend time and about two weeks before I deliver the message, actually writing the message. And I manuscript the message out and it changes every so often. But by that point, the message is about 80% there, 85% there. And then what I do is I send it on to a couple of our team members and um, a guy and a girl. We wanna make sure we get good perspective from um, both sides, right? And so they give me feedback and one is kind of higher level, one is very, very detailed. And I get that feedback and I pray through the feedback and then um, kind of work on the message more and get it to about 90 to 95% there. And then a few days out from the delivery, um, even up till a few hours before I deliver the message, like the last like 5% comes. And that's where I'm praying through it on a deeper level in a deeper way. I'm asking God to work it through my heart before I stand up and share it with our people and, and so on. And then comes the time in the delivery room, what we, what we see here this morning. Now, up until this morning, this was one of those messages where the last 5% was coming even just a few hours ago. And as I manuscripted this out, the way that I had initially started the message was, as we step into the story of Israel in Judges chapter six, we find a nation that continues to struggle with idolatry. And don't worry, like that's very boring. I know when you hear that, like I, I was gonna try to like make it, you know, sound better or start with a story, whatever. But as I was reviewing, like I couldn't get past that line. As we step into the story of Israel in Judges chapter six, we find a nation that continues to struggle with idolatry. And I couldn't get by it. I'm like, God, it's just something's, something's not right. Do you ever have that feeling like just something's off? Just a little bit. You ever have that feeling? Like you can't put your finger on it, but it's just like you just can't get past it. Something feels off just a little bit. And so I'm looking at it. As we step into the story of Israel, the story of Israel, hold up, something's wrong there. And, and it just hit me a minute. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. But before we stand up and, and like dive into this story in Judges chapter 6, like the Lord said, you gotta make sure like you get the, the, the story right, like whose story this is. This isn't Israel's story. Now, if I said that and I began with that and then I jumped into the message, you would, you would know what I meant, right? But the Lord said, no, no, no. You gotta get the right context for what you're gonna read and what you're gonna teach. Because the, the story is not the story of Israel, the story is the story of God. It's the story of Jehovah Elohim, the Lord our God. And it's amazing when like you get the right context, how everything else like begins to fall into its proper place, right? Like the story isn't your pain, as real as that is. It's not your, it's not your story. Like it's part of the story, but as we said last week, it's not worthy of being the center of the story. You know, and, and, and if I said this, like, as we step into the story of Pastor Dave, no, 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 it's not Pastor Dave's story. This is the story of Jehovah Elohim. As we step into the story of my wife, Carrie, not her story. 
as we step into the story of Greg, not Greg's story either, you got to get the right context as you step into the story. And it's amazing when you start with that right context, how the things just start kind of opening up, right? So as we step into the story of God in Judges chapter 6, what we find is, is we find the people of God are in a deep struggle with idolatry. Now, they have long since been out of the land of Egypt in the promised land, but Egypt isn't yet quite out of them. They're out of Egypt, but Egypt isn't yet out of them. And to show you like where this leads the people of God to, it leads them to living on the run, like running, fleeing. You ever meet anybody that just can't like face up to something? Like face reality, you know what I'm talking about? Well, this is where they're at, like they're on the run, they're living on the run, and their mind has been so distorted by idolatry that they become convinced, well, this is just the way it's supposed to be. Let me show you how low it gets. In verse number two, pull, pull those on the, put those verse on the screen for me if you would. Verse two, it says, because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in the mountain clefts and caves and strongholds. And so here they were, they were off preparing shelters up in the barren mountains, places that they could run to when the Midianites would invade. And you know what that indicates? They were distracted with preparation up in the barren land that they were missing out on the God-given opportunity to work this, this amazing agricultural land that God had provided them with. They're up there in the mountains, ready to run and ready to camp out there, when as children of God, they, they should have been in freedom, plowing and planting and harvesting on these lush agricultural plains of the nation of Israel. Like, there's no agriculture in the whole world like there is in the nation of Israel, and that's where the children of God should have been investing, but instead, they're running, they're fleeing with this threat of invasion. And I thought about this. I wonder how many of us this morning, we're on the run, we're running from something, and we're not even aware of it. Like you're running because you think running is gonna solve the problem. And how many of you have been around long enough to know that running never solves it, right? It never does. Avoiding doesn't solve it, does it? It would be nice if, if it were that easy. It'd be nice if God would let us get off the hook like that, wouldn't it? If I just ignore it, it'll go away. Let's just pretend like the Midianites aren't coming and then it'll just, you know, it'll work itself out. It doesn't work that way. You see, God loves us way too much to allow us to live on the run as children of God. And you know, this is why, I think about this, this is why people run from one marriage to another marriage. Or one relationship to another relationship, to another relationship, to another relationship. Or, I've seen this before, people run from one job to another job to another job to another job looking for the right job. I've seen this. Let's just be honest, like I know I'm a pastor and, and I lead a church, but I've seen where people run from church to church to church to church. Like, why are we running? Well, you say, I'm running because of the Midianites. No, 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 no. Let me tell you why the children of God were on the run. The children of God were on the run, not because of the Midianites. The children of God, they were on the run because they were worshiping idols that couldn't sustain them when the Midianites came. They were on the run because there was a much deeper issue in the heart. You see, where God wanted them was in the lush green valley, toiling the land. As agriculturalists, that's where God wanted them. There was nothing wrong with the valley. There was nothing wrong with the land. The issue was the gods that they had worshipped couldn't sustain them when the pressure of the Midianites came. And you know, that's why we read here, God allowed the Midianites to enter the country because there was some work that had to be done in the heart of God's people. You know, this is the story. 
And when God, Jehovah Elohim, the Lord our God, is the center of the story, what we find is, is we find that he refuses to let us just stay the way that we are. Like he goes after us. He refuses to let you just keep living on the run because he wants the, the real issue to be settled in the heart. You see, you can be in the promised land and still not be free. And this is exactly what we see in Israel at this point. And so look at what happens in verse six. As a result of the Midianites, Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord, Jehovah. Remember, this is the name we studied in group this past week. You were in group this past week, right? I was in Cuba with a group of, of our people and my wife, but you were in group, right? Amen? This is the name you study, Jehovah, the creator God who longs to relate to his creation, who's intimately aware of the details of our lives. They cried out to the Lord for help. They reached a point where they were exhausted from their running. And you will reach that point, won't you? You always do. At some point, you got to decide that you're going to stop running and have the courage to face it. Because your real issue is not your last job, and it's not your last boss. Your real issue is your issue with authority that needs to be worked out. The real issue wasn't your last girlfriend or the one before that or the one before that or the one before that. The real issue is the savior complex that you've got or that identity issue that you've got that goes unresolved. And see, God loves us way too much to let us stay that way. He loves us way too much than to allow us to live on the run. And so what happens here, look at verse seven. So when it, the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet. He sent them a prophet. That's some, those are important words. And let me tell you why. Uh, on the plane down to Cuba, like this is like our only time to ever watch movies. Usually it's the D D Disney Channel or Nickelodeon or something like that. Can I get an amen from any parents in the house this morning. Like, that's usually what my TV time looks like at home. So we're on the plane to Cuba, and um, they've got movies, and I saw The Darkest Hour. How many of you have seen The Darkest Hour? An incredible movie. For those that haven't seen it, it's the story of Winston Churchill and his leadership uh, during World War II. And I was amazed. I was just amazed at how courageous his leadership was in the face of Nazi Germany invading and ravaging like the rest of Europe. Like, here was a man who stood up and said, no, we're not just going to bow down to their threats. And I was just amazed at, at their leadership. And what amazes me at the story here in Judges 6 is that here the Midianites have invaded, and the first person that God sends to the, to the nation of Israel is not a Winston Churchill. The first person that God sends to Israel is not a military leader. Did you see what it said here? In verse 8, he sent them a prophet. Because he knows, like God could free Israel of the Midianites instantly, couldn't he? Like he could say the word and the Midianites would be gone. He could wipe them off, off the face of the earth. But God knows that he could do that, but his people would still be in bondage. Because the deeper bondage, the real bondage is the bondage in their heart to the idols, to these lifeless idols. And so I think it's so fascinating that God sent them a prophet. Why? Because what God is after is the heart. God wants your heart free from idolatry. God wants your heart free from anything that's coming in his place. God wants your heart free. He wants your heart dislodged and, and free from all of that clutter and all of that junk. And he will stop at nothing to dislodge your heart from something that cannot save you. This is what he's after. It's just incredible to me. So the Lord sends them a prophet. Now, I think this is an important point to make. That even though God doesn't always send us what we want, he always sends us what we need. And sometimes what we want and what we need go hand in hand. But how many of you know that it doesn't always look that way? Like you think that you, you know, you, you want like another boyfriend but what you need right now is you need a season of intimacy with Jesus. And you may think that you, 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 you want, like I just want that job, but what you need right now is you need to learn how to be a good employee. Where you are, just faithful, where you are. 
Like, that's what you need. I am so thankful God doesn't always send us what we want, but he always sends us what we need. And so we see here, look, look at verse number um, eight, the second part. It says that, that, the, that the prophet said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. And look at verse 10. I said to you, say that with me. I said to you, I am the Lord your God, Jehovah Elohim. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. God said, I've spoken to you, but you didn't listen. And this is a sure sign of idolatry. It's hearing loss. You don't hear the voice of God, the word of God clearly. God says, I've spoken, and you haven't listened. I've tried to bring you freedom, and you haven't listened. Like, all those things you've been going through that you've just been writing off as coincidence or whatever, God says, that, I was speaking to you. That person that came your way that said, you know what, that's probably not why. God was speaking to you, but you've not listened. And this is what idols do. Idols create hearing loss. This is why the message of the churches in Revelation, it closes with, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the seven churches. Romans 10, 17, what did Paul say? Faith comes by Hearing and hearing by the, and that's what idols do for you. They distort your hearing. They create hearing loss. They distract you from hearing from the voice of God. So much so that you find yourself up in the mountains running from the Midianites and you become convinced, well, this must be where God wants you to be. No, he doesn't. God wants you free down there on this lush, green, agricultural plain. He wants you operating in freedom. That's where God wants you. If we're not careful, we will find ourselves giving to the voice of anything other than the word of God. I'll give you an example. Like I've shared, been very honest and vulnerable with you. Like, man, there's times in, just in leadership, it's very easy to struggle with the approval of people, right? You know what I've learned? A good way to make myself miserable and to displease God is to value the voice of people over the voice of God. You know, let me just get a little more specific, like, like take social media, for example. Uh-oh. <laughs> Can I just say that, like, when you post, like, God doesn't want you having to, like, recheck it every two minutes to see how many liked it and who liked it or who commented. And he doesn't want your heart all upset because you like somebody else's and they didn't like yours and what's their problem? Are you with me? It's getting really quiet in here, but I'm telling you. <laughs> it's easy for the heart to drift into that place of like you value the affirmation of others more so than the love that God is, is wanting to lavish on you. Like God is saying, don't, don't find your identity in me, yeah. not in attention. Yeah. God said, I said to you, but you have not listened to me. Verse 11, what we see now is we see God doing in the heart of the leader of his people what he needs to do in the heart of his people, okay? And he begins with the leader. The angel of the Lord came, and he sat down on the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizarite, where his son Gideon, important person here, was threshing wheat in the wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now, Gideon, Gideon was a farmer, okay? And I gotta explain the, the importance of this verse, because in this verse, what we get is Gideon is a farmer threshing wheat in the wine press. Now, this is humiliating from him. He's operated in a place of humiliation. And the reason why we know that is because as a farmer, you know that you do not thresh wheat down by the wine press in a place of privacy. 
Where you thresh wheat is up on top of the hill where there's a constant breeze. And as you toss that wheat into the air, the breeze comes through and catches the chaff, the undesirable portion, and carries it away. And the wheat that has value falls to the ground. And here we find a farmer, this guy who knows better, that he is down in a place of privacy threshing wheat. What's he doing? He's operating out of fear. And because we see that, we know that God's not going to let that fear remain. God's going to begin to probe his heart, right? Because it's easy after a period of time of threshing wheat by the wine, well, this must be where God wants me. Or it's easy when you run to the mountains hiding enough. When you start running from stuff, when you do that enough, it's easy when you get up there to convince, well, this must be where God wants you. No, God wants you in freedom. And that tension that you have, that you've been trying to dismiss, maybe it's not the devil. Maybe it's the Holy Spirit saying, I love you way too much than to continue to allow you to operate in this fear. It's the Holy Spirit probing the heart. You see, here's the danger, though, is when you've got hearing loss, it's amazing what you'll begin to attribute to the enemy. Maybe it's not the enemy. Maybe it's the voice of God that's trying to really deal with the issue. Are you with me? This is how distorted our minds get. This is why God takes idolatry so seriously. So God begins to probe Gideon's heart, and Gideon knows this tension. It's the same tension we experience. You know, as a child of God, I think of Galatians 5.1. Paul said it like this. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. That's what God wants for you. And so as he probes Gideon's heart, we see this in verse 12, that the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, and he said, the Lord is with you, my warrior. Now, is this angel of the Lord patronizing Gideon, this man operating out of fear? I don't believe that. What I believe is that what, God, what this angel of the Lord and what God sees in Gideon is he sees in Gideon all of his potential and his calling that he's put within him. And now what he's going to do is he's going to draw it out. He's going to draw it out. That tension, God's going to probe the heart and he's going to draw out all the potential that God has put within him. And so look at this next verse. It says, verse 13, but uh, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But, but sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders of our fathers that, that, that told us about when they said that did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. How distorted has their mind become? It's become distorted to the point that they were worshiping these idols and they wonder why they've got to be on the run and they're up there in the mountains running from the real issue and they're attributing where they are to God. Well, we have to be here because God has abandoned us. This is what I'm saying. When the enemy begins to work in the mind, this is how messed up our thinking can become. It reminds me of what the psalmist said in Psalm 115 when, when it speaks of like comparing the one true God uh, against all the other like gods of, of other nations, these gods who can't see, who can't hear, who can't feel, who can't deliver, and so on. And it says this in verse number eight of Psalm 115, those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. You become like the God that you worship. You become like your idol. But this is what I'm saying. God loves you way too much to continue to allow you to live on the run. Why are you living on the run? Why are you running? I'm running because of the Midianite. No, you're running because there's an idol in the heart that can't sustain you when the pressure gets turned up. Verse 14, this is important. The Lord turned. Did you notice up until this point it was the angel of the Lord? Now what is it? The Lord turned to him. And let me tell you, when the Lord turns... When he turns and he speaks, you can't ignore it. The Lord turned and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? 
Get it? I am deploying you for the purpose and for the calling with all the potential that I put within you. You are going to go out in my strength, and you are going to deliver Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? The Lord turned. And I believe that for many of us today, the Lord is turning to us and saying, because he's saying enough is enough. I don't want you living in bondage any longer. Come down out of the hills, out of the barren mountains, stop running, and start living in the freedom that I have for you. He's saying enough is enough. We see Isaiah's calling in Isaiah 6, and I love that story when Gideon sees the glory of God manifesting in such a powerful way. And I love Gideon's response, or excuse me, Isaiah's response. Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. And when he reaches that point, he's not ready for God's calling on his life. So here's what happens. If you follow this story here into the very next uh, verse, verse 15, but Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family, but Lord, this brings us to the name of God that we're studying today. All of that was just my introduction. All of the men are in here. That's not funny. <laughs> I did get one. Keep preaching, brother, in the 930 service, in case you were wondering. Keep going. Keep going. All right. Now, as I get ready to close, but Lord. Now, you'll notice this Lord here is not capital L-O-R-D. It is capital L, lowercase O R. D, okay? It's a different use of Lord. And this word is the Hebrew name for God, Adonai. And what this name means is owner, ruler, master. But Lord, my owner, my ruler, my master. And you know what this tells me? Is that whatever idol had been occupying Gideon's heart, it's been dislodged. Because in your heart, there's only room for one Lord. It's not room for the voice of people and the voice of God. It's not room for the affirmation of people and the affirmation of God. Are you with me? Like, there's only room for one of these. One Lord. And what this tells me is, is that through this conversation and as the Lord turns to Gideon, whatever happens in his heart, the idol is dislodged and his heart gets free. And I think today that that's what God is doing to a lot of us. Through his word, as God has spoken, he's been probing and probing and probing. And I bet it's been happening over the past several weeks, maybe months, maybe days, but he's been probing. And he's trying to get you free. And he's saying, he's inviting you. Would you come down from the barren mountains into this lush green valley of life that I provided for you? I don't want you up there. I want you down here. I want you free. And what this response of Gideon indicates is the appropriate response to lordship. Lord, I've got questions. Lord, you know my heart. I've got questions. I don't know how it's all gonna work out, Lord. I don't know, but I trust you. Because he says, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest, and I'm the least. Gideon says, Lord, I don't know how it's gonna happen, but I trust you as Lord. And I believe that what we see in Gideon is the appropriate response to Adonai. I don't have all the answers, but I know you do, and I trust you, Jesus. I surrender. This is what's interesting, and as I close, I promise now. 
you step into the New Testament and the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew name Adonai is the word kurios. It's the word that we use when we say Jesus is Lord. And we know that the appropriate response to the Lordship of Jesus is not just an acknowledgement. The appropriate response is surrender. That's the full response. And so I wonder today, what maybe has God surfaced in here that needs to be confessed? What idol has he trying, been trying to dislodge that we need to repent of? For some of you, it's gonna look like a rededication of your heart in some way, shape, or form. Maybe it's not this huge thing, but maybe it's a little subtle thing you've let slip in over time. That's usually what idolatry looks like. And for some of us, what that's gonna mean is it's gonna mean surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior for the very first time. And here's what's really cool. When Adonai is my Lord, my owner, my ruler, my master, the promise of verse 16 is for us all. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites together. God says, we'll take care of the Midianites. But first, let's resolve the issue of the heart. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time you've given us in your word. Thank you for the truth and the power of your word. Thank you for your spirit, Lord, who is alive and speaking and is taking the truth of your word into the deep crevices of our hearts. And God, as your people, I believe there's probably many of us that are running from something. Our hearts are on the run. Externally, maybe we look like we've got it all together on the outside, but deep down on the inside, there's something we're, we're fleeing from. And God, it's because we've allowed an idol into our heart that can't sustain the pressure of our circumstance. God, help us to lean in today. Help us to repent and to turn to you. And may we experience a freedom and a joy and a peace and the life that you have for us. Maybe that we haven't experienced in a long time. And God, I want to pray, Lord, especially for any heart that has never trusted you as Lord and Savior. May today be the day that they say yes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin and for the life that you've provided in him. God, we love you and we're trusting you now to do your work in our hearts. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Everybody's very still and quiet for just a moment. If you're here today, you've never trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And today you're ready to say yes for the first time. I wanna lead you in a prayer as an expression of faith in him. I'm gonna ask that you pray this prayer out loud after me. And I'm gonna ask that we would all pray this prayer out loud to support those of you who are making this decision for the first time today. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sin. Come into my heart, cleanse me of my sin. Give me the courage to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.